mercy and peace be yours. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forevermore. Amen. I need your help this morning filling in the blanks on a few lines from some hopefully familiar movies. Roger, I'm looking at you for this first one, okay? Electra says to James Bond, looks at him and says, I could have given you the world. And 007, looking back at her, responds, The world is not enough. All right, that was the toughest one. I think they get easier from here. <laughs> Don't you forget about me. Plays in the background as Brian stands in the middle of the classroom reading the essay that they've prepared for Mr. Vernon to himself. And as he comes to the end of the essay, he closes out the movie with the words, Sincerely yours... Alyssa, the Breakfast Club. All right, Commissioner Gordon looks down at his son as their rescuer speeds away on the Batmobile, and he explains to him, we'll hunt him because he can take it, because he's not a hero. He's our silent guardian. He's a watchful protector. He's a... Anyone? Oh, I thought they were getting easier. Dark night. A dark night. All right, this is the last one. I hope, I hope the easiest. <coughs> Doc Brown's plan crystallizes in his mind. And he explains it to young Marty who's standing by. He says, if we could somehow harness this lightning, if we could pass it through the flux capacitor, this just might work. Yes. Saturday night, we're going to send you back to the future. Oh, thank you. I was hoping we get at least one out of four. <laughs> These aren't just familiar movie lines. They're something that we could call title drops. A title drop is when the, the director of the movie puts the title of the movie into the script so that one of the characters reads the title of the movie, and as we're watching it, we go, oh, that's the name of the movie. I wasn't entirely honest with you. I have one more. And it's not actually a movie, but it is a scene that I know you are familiar with. The women were making their way to the tomb. And as they went, they were wondering to themselves, who is going to roll the stone away? But as they looked up, they saw that their problem had already been taken care of. The stone was already cast aside. As they went into the tomb, they were met by two angels, one of whom greeted them and told them, don't be afraid. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He is not here. He is risen. It's the first Easter gospel proclamation after Jesus had risen from the dead. He is risen. And that word from the angel to those faithful women has become the triumphant victory cry of the church. Nowhere else is the hope and promise of Christians crystallized so firmly as it is in those words, Christ is risen. We've enshrined it in our liturgies, in, in our most cherished hymns. It focuses our worship. It focuses our hearts on the truth that Jesus, our Savior, has conquered death and is risen. That word is a central part of the history of that fateful and wonderful day. And that message directs us in, in two directions. First, to come. To come and to treasure what happened for us on that day. But then also to go. To go and through our words 
and our actions witness to the word the power of our living, risen Savior and Lord. Let's first consider the historical sequence of that morning because if you read through the Easter accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it can be a little confusing as we try to take all of the details from all four of those accounts and and put them together. So let's take a moment to look at the story as we have it through those accounts. First, we know that on Friday, after Jesus had died, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to Pontius Pilate and asked him for Jesus' body. They took it from the cross and they laid it in a tomb owned by Joseph. Before they laid it to rest, however, they prepared it for burial, but the process was rushed because they had to be done by sundown because at sundown the Sabbath began. And so while Nicodemus brought 75 pounds of powdered, dried spices and herbs to to wrap in the wrappings as they laid Jesus to rest. There was not time for them to bring the oils and perfumes that traditionally were rubbed into the body. So they laid him to rest. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, one of Jesus' disciples, were there observing. They saw that all was not done as they wished it would have been. And out of their love for Jesus, they deeply desired to to rectify that. But the following day was the Sabbath, when no such work could be done. So they waited. And as the Sabbath ended at sundown, then the shops would open for a few short hours before closing again for the night. During that time, the women went and they made their purchases. They bought the oils, the perfumes they would need to anoint the body of Jesus. But now it was nighttime. So they would wait once again until the morning when they would go to give their Lord and their Savior a proper burial. But before they could do that, very early on Sunday morning, our Savior Jesus rose from the dead passed through his burial wrappings, passed through the exterior of the tomb without disturbing a single thing. And in order to announce his resurrection, God the Father sent two angel messengers and he shook the earth with a quake. Those angels took that heavy stone and rolled it away from the entrance to the tomb and then sat down upon it. And the soldiers who were standing guard fainted, paralyzed with fright. And the moment they regained their composure, they fled from the scene. And then, then those faithful women who had set out at first light arrived at the scene, wondering to themselves, Who will roll the stone away? But as they looked, they saw that had already been done. It's about this time, most likely, that Mary Magdalene turned and ran back to the disciples to tell them that Jesus' tomb had been opened, his body had been taken, she would later return with Peter and John before she would see Jesus with her own eyes. But the rest of the women went on into the tomb. There they were greeted by these two angel messengers, one of whom spoke to them, and we heard the words of his initial greeting, he is not here, he has risen. But let us examine now the two directions that he gave to those women, what they were supposed to do with that glorious, wonderful news. First he said to them, come. See the place where they laid him. Come in and contemplate the cold, empty slab of stone where his body had been laid. The burial clothes are still there, but there is no body. So think about what that means. 
He is not here. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. But go, he says, cutting off their contemplation. Go, you can't stay here. Go and tell the disciples and Peters he has gone on ahead of you. Go to Galilee where you will see him just as he told you. I don't know if you remember, but a few weeks back we read the words where Jesus promised them that. In Mark chapter 14, as they were setting out from the upper room in Jerusalem, making their way to Gethsemane, Jesus said to his disciples, if I can find where it is, he said to his disciples, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And so after just a brief visit to the tomb, these women are sent forth with a commission to spread this precious message that Jesus has risen, that he keeps his promises, that the disciples would see him once again. Friends, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. That's the core of it, isn't it? That's the good news that we're here to celebrate today. But how do we do it? What are we supposed to do to celebrate this glorious fact that Christ, our Lord, is risen? Allow me to suggest that we do two things. First, come. Come and see the place where they laid him. Come and revel in the wonder of an empty tomb. And as you come, remember this. Those women set out that morning thinking that they were going to the tomb so that they could perform a service to Jesus. But when they arrived they discovered that it was Jesus who had sent his angel messengers to provide a service to them. And so as you come to the tomb this morning, be ready to be served by your Savior Jesus as he sends his messengers to you also. His messengers of word and sacrament preaching and celebration of brothers and sisters in Christ to lift you up in mutual encouragement. Come and see, my friends, come and see the empty tomb with an added blessing that those women did not yet have. The knowledge that comes from the Holy Spirit of all that the Scriptures communicate to us. You see, the women did not yet fully understand the meaning that Christ had risen. It wasn't until later that evening when Jesus came and appeared in a room in Jerusalem with them and the rest of the disciples. He looked at them. He breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he opened up their mind so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what I said to you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So here as we gather to celebrate the empty tomb and to contemplate its meaning for us, we do it not just thinking of the fact that his body is no longer there, but we do it reflecting on all of the other facts that Jesus' Spirit has taught us since. The promises kept and the prophecies fulfilled from all of the Old Testament, many of which we've had the opportunity to reflect upon this week. The visitations he made later that day to his disciples and over the next 40 days. His ascension into heaven to take up his seat at the Father's right hand. 
His outpouring of the Holy Spirit onto the Christian church. His outpouring of the Holy Spirit to you 2,000 years later on the other side of the globe through water and the Word, through His body and blood to bind you to Himself, to make you a part of Him so that his death and resurrection become your death and resurrection. So that the power of Easter for you is that in Christ your sins were put to death on the cross. And in Christ you yourself were raised to everlasting life on Easter morning. A life that begins today and continues into eternal life in heaven with him forever. That's what we see as we look into the empty tomb. We see our life flash before our eyes, and not just our life that lies behind us, but we see a glimpse of our life that is still to come. As we look at that, some of you this morning might think, this is pretty great. I wish I could stay here just a little longer. And you can. There's breakfast right after our service, and then there's a whole other service to come. But then you have to go. You have to go, like the angel said, you have to go and tell about the things that you have seen and that you've heard. The wonderful truths that you learn and remember this Easter morning that Christ from Nazareth, who was crucified, is not here. He has risen. And that truth is significant. It's significant for so many reasons, but because I'm asking you to go and to tell other people about it, let's boil it down to three important facts. First, forgiveness. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price for all of our sins that we might be forgiven. And his resurrection is our assurance that that forgiveness has been won. That Easter Sunday evening when Jesus came to his disciples, he said to them, if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. That is the power of Easter for you. You have the power to release someone from their debt of sin simply by communicating to them the news, you are forgiven. It's an opportunity that you're able to take with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It's an opportunity that you're able to take with those who do not yet know Christ and as such do not yet know the wonderful news of true forgiveness. Second, you're able to share with them the wonderful news of freedom from death. I hate to spoil the mood, but it's tax week. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could go out this week and tell everyone, you are free from taxes, you do not have to pay them. But that is not the power of Easter for us, at least not yet. But that other certainty right, it's not just taxes, it's death and taxes, we are able to bring some pretty awesome news concerning that. That we have been set free from death. We have been made victors over death. That through Christ's death and his resurrection, death has been undone. Death is the one thing that unites all people on earth. It's the one thing we all have in common, one thing that everyone during their life thinks about, one thing that everyone experiences. It's the one thing that will provide for everyone an opportunity at some point in their life for us to make at least a witness to them about the truths we know because of Easter that death 
is no longer the thing that ushers us into punishment for our sins. But death, now because it has been vanquished by our Savior Jesus, is the doorway through which he ushers us into eternal life with him. And that's the third and final blessing that we're able to go and tell to the world. Eternal life with Jesus. The message for the women to take to the disciples was to go and tell them and and Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. The message, the mission that's been given to you is to go and tell others that Jesus has gone ahead of us into his Father's kingdom. And there, he is preparing a place for you. You will see him there, just as he has told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. Christ be with you, friends. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of our Savior Jesus, the peace he won for us through his life and death and resurrection, the peace that is beyond our human understanding, may that peace be with you today and forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.